Good morning. Good morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I can make it faster. Yeah, you know. You're going to have a link to the music. We'll see. <laughs> when you came in, you should have been given a program. Inside that program are a couple of things. First thing I want to point out is this ascent card. Take a minute, fill that out, let us know that you're here. On the back of the ascent card is a place for prayer and praise requests. I uh, would love to come alongside you and pray for things that are going on in your life. Praise God for what he's done in your life. And there's a next step that we'll talk about during our, our service. And also in there is this offering envelope. If you've come prepared this morning to give an offering as part of your worship, you can use that. And on the inside, there's multiple ways to give. You can read through that. How many days until Easter? Isn't that crazy? This year has gone by fast. So remember, we have cards on the tables that we're praying for names of people that we are going to be inviting to Easter services. So continue to be praying for all of those names and let ask that God will go before us and prepare hearts and minds and prepare the way for that conversation. So um, will you pray with me and we will get going with our, our message. Lord Jesus, just <clears throat> I want to say thank you for every blessing that you give, Lord. And as we do this study today, Lord, I just, again, I just have to say thank you, and thank you just isn't enough for the sacrifice that you have made for us. We, uh, we, we worship you, we praise you, because you are God. You are our living Savior. You are the sacrifice that washes away our sin. We just, we worship you this morning. As we come before you this morning, I just pray, as I always pray each and every time, that we can put away distractions of our busy lives, of, of different situations that are going on, and we can just put those behind us, and we can focus on you, Jesus, and, and have you be the center of everything that we do this morning, and that you can be the focus of our time. We love you, we praise you. Can you guess what, what the sermon's on today? Hebrews. Hebrews. Hey, somebody's paying attention. <laughs> Hebrews. Uh, we started talking last week about the idea of these copies and shadows. All right? So uh, we're talking about how the Old Testament um, was not flawed, but it had faults. So it wasn't a perfect system. But it was a system that showed us who God is. It was a system that showed us our faults. It's a system that shows us what sin is and what it looks like. And it's a system that shows us kind of the consequences of our sin. All right, so we talked about that last week. And this week we continue on in chapter 9 of Hebrews. And we are going to cover a giant portion today. We're going to, going to cover chapter 9 and part of chapter 10 today. So uh, hold on to your uh, your blinking lights and uh, <laughs> we will do our best to cover that much territory today. All right. It takes a second for this thing to, to, to warm up. So Today we're talking about a better sacrifice. So we've talked about a better priest. We've talked about a, a better um, a system. And today we're talking about this idea of a better sacrifice. All right? I don't know why the verses are wrong. I changed this. But we're talking about this better. It's really kind of the whole theme of the book of Hebrews is Jesus. Jesus is a better prophet, he's a better priest, he's a better king, he brings a better covenant, and he brings a better sacrifice. So Jesus is better, and we've titled this sermon series, Jesus is Greater Than, and he is greater than all these things, right? Because Jesus is greater than anything that we can worship, he's greater than anything we can follow, he's greater than any prophet, other prophet, and he's greater than any other priest. He's greater than any other king. He is greater than, and he is a better sacrifice. So we talked about this idea of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament system described is 
<clears throat> now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place for holiness, for the tent was prepared. There's some words here that I've underlined, and we're going to talk about those for a minute. Because when we look at this word regulation, it, it kind of, in my opinion, it kind of stands out because that's not a word that you kind of you would think you would see in this context, in my opinion, where it's a regulation for worship. Because we come to worship and we don't think about, well, there's regulations that we have to follow, right? We come and we just worship and we praise Jesus. Uh, first thing that we need to point out is this idea of a tent. In the Old Testament, God set up this um, tabernacle, right? It's, it's a tent. It's a booth. <clears throat> and it's a copy of things to come. It's not necessarily just a copy of the temple that was built. But it is a copy of things to come, like heaven, the place where God resides, right? And this idea of regulations, these are the requirements, the regulations, the procedures. And in this case, this is the regulations of worship. So when we get into this idea of worship in the Old Testament, and who was worshiping and who and how they worship, all right? So people, they would worship by bringing their sacrifices to the tabernacle or to the tent, right? And they weren't worshiping the priests by doing that. They were worshiping God by doing that. But they had to come and have this priest who was an intercessor between God and man do the sacrifices, all right? And we had talked about this a little bit of how busy the priests are, and there really was no time to sit down. There was no chairs in the tabernacle or in the temple or anything like that, because they're continually working, right? Well, here is kind of the day in the life of a priest that we're going to get to, okay? So in chapter 9, verse 2, it says, the tent was prepared for the first session in which session section <laughs> In which was the lampstand, the table, and the bread of, of the presence. And it was called the holy place. So you first walk into this tabernacle, the priesthood. And in this first section, this is the holy place. And we have the lampstands and the table of showbread. And, uh, and behind the second curtain was the second section called the most holy of holies. So remember what we have talked about before. There was this veil and that separated the holy priests where the priests did their work and it separated the place called the Holy of Holies which is where the presence of God would be okay and in this Holy of Holy place having the gold altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was the golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the table the tablets of the covenant <laughs> Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these, these things we cannot speak in detail. So the author is saying, okay, we're not going to go into detail about these, but these are just highlights that we need to know. We have the holy place, we have the holy of holies, and we have this veil that is separated, right? And consequently, when Jesus died, what happened? The veil was ripped in two, right? From the top to the bottom. Yes. It was ripped in two because Jesus has sacri sacrificed for our sins, and now we have an intercess intercessory through Jesus instead of these priests. Now we do not have this separation between us and God because Jesus is God, right? So we don't have this separation anymore of being between the holy place and the holy of holies. Remember, All right. The tabernacle was really small, though, wasn't it? 15 by 30, about the size of half of this room? No, <laughs> it was bigger than that. I, I thought yeah. 15 by 30 was something I read. Yeah, I they, they, they had a different measure. They had cubits. <laughs> yeah, so if you walk into the tabernacle, it was probably going to be, I'm trying to remember, we did a, uh, we did a, they did a, a walkthrough of a life-size replica, and Probably the Holy of Holies was maybe about as big as this room, 
Oh, yeah. Or the holy the holy place was about as big as this room, maybe a little bit bigger. And then they go on into the holy of holies. So it was probably honestly about as big as this front section of our building. So okay. and I it was, it was crowded. Yeah, it was <laughs> portable. Yeah. So so we're not going to speak about the details, but I want to talk about the priests. All right, and kind of talk you through the life of a priest. And remember, all the Israelites were bringing stuff to the, 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 the sacrifices to the priest, and they would be doing this. So they would have daily offerings that they would have to do. They would have burnt offerings, offer a male year, year old lamb every, every morning and evening. They would have grain offerings that they would have to offer, <clears throat> making an offering of two quarts of flour and a quart of olive oil every morning and evening. And they would maintain inside, right? They would trim the wicks, they would have the oil, and in the in the holy place, which is the first section, and that was every morning and evening. And then they would pour out drink offerings, uh, pour out a quart on the altar every morning and evening. And this was kind of some kind of like a maybe coffee, <laughs> some kind of stiff drink. I don't know. <clears throat> and they would put incense on the altar every morning and evening. So these are the daily offerings they had to do. And then they go to these weekend or weekly offerings, all right? And uh, kind of like the weekend type of thing, they would offer double offerings morning and evening. Um, they would change the loaves on the table of showbread. Now this table of showbread, I don't know if you kind of understand this or not, but they had these 12 loaves that were on there, and they represented the 12 tribes of Israel that God provided for during um, the Exodus uh, God's provision for the 12 tribes of Israel. And they would maintain the lampstands, put an incense on the altar every morning and evening. And monthly offerings, all right, they would do burnt offerings, offering two bulls, one ram, seven lambs. Grain offerings, offering six quarts for each bull, which is that times two. Four quarts for each ram and two quarts for each lamb. And then they would offer drink offerings, offering two quarts for each bull, two times two. Quart Quart and a quarter, that's hard to say. One and a quarter quarts for each ram and one quart for each or for each ram and one quart for each ram. Then they would offer these sin offerings, offering a goat and a drink offering. All right. So you can kind of see how the priests didn't have time to sit down. But it goes even further than that because they had seasonal offerings. All right. When you look through uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we find all these festivals that the, the people are coming to and celebrating, and the priests would offer special offerings at this time. So we find the festival of Passover, we find the festival of unleavened bread, we find the festival of first fruits, we find the festival of harvest, we find the festival of trumpets, tabernacles, and the feast of atonement. All right? And then there were special offerings, like these sin offerings, um, an additional offering regularly made by the priest on behalf of the people. Offerings for intentional sins, like, yeah, I did it. Sorry. Unintentional sins, I didn't mean to do it. I'm sorry. And then other offerings, Thanksgiving offerings, free will offerings, peace offerings, and a wave offering. I was, when I first read this, I'm thinking, like the football stadiums. No, it's not. <laughs> And then we come to the Day of Atonement, which is a big, important day. Um, offerings of, offer all other sacrifices, and then we talk about the Day of Atonement, and that is to offer a bull for the priest's own sin, which that should be sin. That's an extra sin with a G on the end of it. So that's why priests are not musically talented. That you, never mind. <laughs> offer a goat for the sins of the people. And offer a scapegoat on which to place all other sins. All right. So the priests are really busy people. All right. And of these things, we cannot speak of these in the detail. So that's kind of what the author of Hebrews is explaining here is all of these things are happening. This is what the priests did. These are all the sacrifices that were made for the people. And these sacrifices, did they forgive sins? No. They only kind of pushed it forward. So out of all of this work, it is just to push these sins forward. And this is how worship was handled. 
is people would bring their sacrifices to the priest. They would do perform all these duties, and this was the worship to God. All right, uh, verse eight. By the Holy Spirit, by this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. All right. So thinking about this, the we can't go into the holy of holies while the first section is still standing. Okay. How did we? How how did we get into the holy place, holy of holies? Through the veil. Through the veil, through Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. That's how we get into the Holy of Holies, all right? This is all symbolic of the present age. According to the agreement, arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. Cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. But deal only with the food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. All right, so I want to talk about this word symbolic for a minute. This word symbolic is just kind of like a parable or an illustration. So all of these sacrifices, the holy of holies, the holy place, all of this is symbolic. This is a parable, an illustration of what is to come. The, the Old Testament, you can't have the New Testament without the Old Testament. And vice versa, you can't really have the Old Testament without the New Testament. Because the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. The Old Testament foreshadows and shows us the New Testament. All right? Do you follow that? <coughs> so all these things are symbolic of things to come. So all these sacrifices, all these duties of the priest, all these tabernacles and everything are parables or an illustration of things to come. All right, and if uh, I made one revision on my uh, slideshow, and I'll tell you, I don't have the second word up there because I forgot to put it in the second revision too. <laughs> but we talked about this reformation, this word reformation. All right, so we have symbolic and reformation. That what till this reformation comes? Can you guess what the reformation is? Jesus, he comes, <laughs> and how does it says? Regulations for the body imposed until the Reformation comes. So these are symbolic, and these are the things that we have to do until the Reformation, which is Jesus. He has come, and he has made his... <coughs> made... <coughs> sorry. He has made this... Ref he has made a refuge, reformed all of it. He has fulfilled all of those requirements in his one sacrifice for our sin. And can his sacrifice forgive our sin? Yes. Absolutely. So <clears throat> the thick copies and the foreshadowing and the things that were parables, I was going to say parabolic, but that's a little bit different word. These parables and illustrations of the Old Testament, he comes and he fulfills all of that. Jesus dying on the cross, more than a symbol, more than a parable, more than an illustration. He fulfills all of that. And that's what the Reformation is. <clears throat> so symbolic. <clears throat> For since the law was just a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of the realities, it can never, by the same sacri by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near to it. All right? This is chapter 10. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscience of sin. So, here is the New Testament described. So that kind of describes the Old Testament. Now I want to talk about the New Testament. So how much more will the blood of Christ purify our conscience from dead works to serve a living God? So here is kind of the contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I hope I can see this because I knew when I was doing it that I'm blind. So Old Testament, it was imperfect, right? Not, not that it was wrong, but it had its faults. It was imperfect, all right? The New Testament, 
the new sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice, perfect, right? The new covenant versus the old covenant. New covenant is perfect. Old covenant is imperfect, very limited access, blood of animals, continual sacrifices, unable to clear the conscience of the sinner, temporary stay of execution. Have you ever thought about it that way? This is a temporary stay of execution because <clears throat> the Old Testament could not forgive the sins. It was just a temporary, okay, we're going to push it on forward. We're going to keep putting it on that credit card. We're going to push it off, continue until something better comes along that can forgive our sins, okay? It could not take away sins. But when you look at the New Testament, it is perfect. This new covenant that Jesus brings in, I feel like I've had a lot of coffee, so I'm going to try and... I get excited about this. <laughs> the New Testament, it is perfect. It has unlimited access. There is no more veil between the holy place and the holy of holies because Jesus, he is our priest. He is our high priest. We've talked about that. He, <clears throat> he came and that veil was torn away. He is our... our uh, um, the word just went away. He goes to God for us. Intercession. Intercession. <laughs> I knew it was an I. <laughs> Christ's own blood, his blood was shed for us. He is our sacrifice that was offered. And once and for all, um, inwardly clean, so he, he washes our sins away, able to clear our conscience because he is our Savior. It's permanent, eternal forgiveness. No longer are you putting it on the credit card and pushing it forward. Jesus gives us eternal forgiveness. We don't have to push it forward anymore. He offers the forgiveness and he can take away our sins. Christ's sacrifice. How much more will the blood of Christ purify our conscience from the dead works to serve a living Savior? All right? And also in 922, without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sin. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages and has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Christ's sacrifice. A single sacrifice, perfect for all time, those being sanctified. All right. In Hebrews it says, since the death has occurred that, re that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Okay, there's a couple words here I want us to talk about here. And I've already kind of alluded to it, but I'm going to say it flat out bluntly so that we understand. Who is them? Ah, oh, them. Since the death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under what? Covenant. The first covenant. So who is them? The Jews. It is the Jews. It's the people of Israel. It is the people that are taking their sacrifice and their worship to the priests all these years <clears throat> to push their sin forward to the time when it can be forgiven. So here in Hebrews, <clears throat> it explains that <clears throat> when Jesus died and his blood was shed, it was not only shed for us who comes after that. It was shed for those who came before him. All right? His death has occurred to redeem them and their transgressions under the first covenant. Right? The first covenant being the Old Testament. <clears throat> Through his death, he paid the price to set people free from the sins they committed under the first promise. <clears throat> so here's this looming objection. This is <coughs> this is what I hear a lot of people not in Christianity and not quite understand. Actually, I do hear it from people in Christianity at times. But why was his death necessary? Why couldn't God just say, I forgive you? And why so much blood? You ever heard those questions before? So in Hebrews 6, uh, 9, 16, for where a will is involved, the death of one who made it must be established. Have you ever thought of that? So 
his this will, like our last will and testament, it cannot be enacted until the person that writes that will passes away, right? Understand that? Mm -hmm. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not a, in force as long as the one who has made it is alive. And 18, therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. Okay? So, for when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and on the people. So, when God made his covenant with the, the Hebrews, the Israelites, right, there was blood involved. And that sacrifice sealed that covenant. That was the covenant between God and his people. Saying, this blood, this is the blood of the covenant that the God commanded for you. Alright, so have we kind of ever heard that language before? Alright, so in the Old Testament, the law, God gave Moses the law. Moses explained it to everybody. He sealed it with the sacrifices and the blood. <clears throat> and as we come before God every week here at the Ascent, we kind of see this same or kind of hear this same um, saying, the, so this blood is of the covenant that God will, that commanded you. And in 1 Corinthians, we have this. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in, in remembrance of me. Jesus said that on the night of Passover before his death. So we kind of have this, this same verbiage. We have this same language between God sealing the covenant with the Hebrews. And here we have Jesus sealing this covenant with us. All right. So he says, um, take this cup the new covenant of my blood, and do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. So both blood and death go together. Or, well, yeah, blood and covenant go together. So we have this idea of, uh, in Romans, we understand that the wages of sin is death, right? Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin because we see this um, <clears throat> copy, this foreshadowing in the Old Testament, of this worship where to push their sins forward, they had to take sacrifices and have bloodshed. And But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by sacrificing himself. Jesus, he was the eternal sacrifice. He hung on that cross, and he was the sacrifice for us. And he is our living Savior. That sin is forgiven. And in Hebrews 9, uh, 23, it says, Thus it is necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Who is the better sacrifice? Jesus. He has sealed our eternity in heaven. For Christ has entered not into holy places made by by hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Praise God for that. Amen. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly. It's not that he has to go and offer himself repeatedly every time that we sin. But he has offered himself once and for all for our forgiveness. As the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away the sins and the sacrifices of himself. And just as it is appointed for one man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear.
appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who have eagerly waited for him. That's on the day of judgment. That's an exciting thing, right? We have Jesus. We are covered in his blood. And we will stand there on that day of judgment. And I kind of view it like this. God will be on his throne. He will come before for that day of judgment, kind of like a courtroom. And who is going to be standing next to you to defend you as, as the lawyer? Jesus is going to be there. And he is going to say, this is my child. He is covered in my blood. My blood has washed him clean. Whiter than snow. I think the next phrase is going to be, well done, good and faithful servant. Because we have eagerly <clears throat> waited for him. We're by a single, uh, we already read that. So, What's the application? So what? Why? Why does any of this even matter? The first application is you can pay the price for yourself, for your sins, or you can have Jesus pay it for you. The price of our sins is death, right? Okay, everybody dies. But we're talking about an eternal death. We are talking about an eternal separation from God. We are talking about eternal damnation, right? So we can pay it ourselves, and that's the price. Or we can have Jesus pay it, and we have eternal life only through Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Just as one man was appointed to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once for the bear, to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, but he will be dealing with it on our behalf. So here's a second application. It's possible, possible to live under the new covenant and have a legalistic mindset of law keeping. Have you ever heard that? I think this is very easy for people to slip into because people look at the rituals and the traditions and the things that make them feel, yes, I am doing something, right? But all of those doing things and the rituals and the traditions, those are not what saves us. We are only saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we accept him into our life, and we live for him, we have that forgiveness. We don't have to go through the rituals. We don't have to go through all of this tradition. We don't have to go through all of the law keeping. Because Jesus fulfilled all of that. And when we are living for Jesus, and he is in our life, and he is overflowing out of us, that's the greatest commandment under the law, right? Love God, love people. When, when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these offerings were according to the law. And then, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish a second. He does away. He fulfills the first covenant. That's done. And he establishes a, another covenant, a better covenant, the perfect covenant between us and God. And a third application. It is possible to live, live under the new covenant and wrong, wrongfully delegate our worship to someone else. We have to be careful here because our worship goes to God and Jesus, right? That's who we are to worship. We need to be careful not to fall into the idea of Worshiping, oh, the music that the praise team sings, that is what we are doing. We're not worshiping the music. We're not worshiping the praise team. We're not worshiping the person up front. We're not worshiping the televangelist. It's easy to lose our focus on, oh, 
that's not the type of music I like. Or that's that, that, that's not the way that I like to do the music. It's not the way that I like to hear the words. It's not really the style I want to listen to. Or um, I'm really not growing here because, honestly, I'm not involved. But that's beside the point. <laughs> We get into this idea that these things are more important than true worship of God and Jesus Christ, our Savior. Understand? Amen? Amen. That is who we worship. That is who our covenant is with. Not with any of this physicality down here. But our covenant is with the living Savior, Jesus Christ. He gives us forgiveness. He is worthy to be worshipped. He is our Lord and our Savior. And He is at the right hand of the Father and He intercedes for us. He gives us forgiveness. Amen? And that's the most important thing. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than all of this. It's greater than any style of music, new or old. He is greater than any televangelist, any megachurch, any small church. He is greater. He is the reason that we come together and that we worship. We come together and we worship in <clears throat> unison our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hung on that cross. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Jesus is a better sacrifice. So here's the question. Which do you prefer? The Old Covenant or the New Covenant? I prefer the new one because we have Jesus and he gives us forgiveness. And he is with us. Amen. As we talk about all of this and we reflect on what we have just talked about in Hebrews and the idea of Jesus that night at Passover, or Passover, that Passover when he was about to be arrested, he says, This cup represents my blood, this bread represents my body. This is the symbol of the new covenant. Now, I say symbol because what the new covenant had to have was blood. Jesus hung on that cross. He bled and he died for us. His body was beaten and bruised. And the symbol that Jesus explained was the bread that represents his body and the cup of juice or wine that represents his blood he broke the bread he blessed it and he ate it he poured the juice he blessed it and he drank it every cent and he said and he says as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup you do this in remembrance of me. That's why we do it each and every week. Is We don't want to forget. We want to remember that this is the most important thing in the world, is Jesus' sacrifice. And that's why we do it every week. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we're doing it in the remembrance of me. We want to remember Jesus we want to remember that he is the living Savior. He is our sacrifice for sin. So as we come to the tables today, I want us to think about Jesus, our perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sin. And all that that entails. Because of that sacrifice, that forgiveness, we have eternal life. We have eternal life with Jesus. something to say. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you. We want to come before you this morning as we take communion. We want to remember you. We want to celebrate you. We want to celebrate the forgiveness that only you give us, that only you can offer. We want to thank you for the new covenant. We want to thank you for the sacrifice that you made on that cross for us. Covers us that that remove the separation between 
us in God to the music. I thank you for that. And we want to worship you. As this next song plays, um, make your way to the tables as you feel led. And remember to pray for the names that are on the table also, that are the names that we're trying to invite you to Easter. 